and I'm here with Marianne Boom Boom Maisano, uh, star of stage, screen, audio, video, burlesque, I think a few other things. And uh, she's also the uh, writer and star of Agita and the creator of The Italian Chick. Yeah. Uh, so now, so your, your dad, he, he, um, he did, he was a Mason for a while and then he came back. And is that when he got the cab? Is that when he started yeah, he the cab back, business? He started um, the first cab business in Fort Lee. And interestingly enough, the second cab business was my father's cousin, Babe Maisano. So <clears throat> they had Babe's taxi and they had Joe's taxi. Now, the difference between the two, and I didn't learn this until about eight years ago when I was having dinner in a restaurant and these lovely women all came over to me and we were talking about Fort Lee. And when a friend of mine mentioned about my dad and Joe's taxi, they went, oh, my God. Everybody, like everybody knew my father and my mother. They were like a staple. And it was interesting because they said, we always used your father's company instead of babes because we knew with your father we were going to get your father, your brother, or your cousins. With babes, we were going to get carnival people that were coming into town. <laughs> we didn't want to put our kids in a car with carny people. Okay? <laughs> and then this one told me the sweetest story because you learn things, you know, as you grow up, you learn things that soften you more about what your childhood was like. And it gets you to really settle in and, and, and understand it better, you know? And she said, and then in the morning, I'd give my kids money and say, okay, now when Joe picks you up, when he drops you off, you give him this money. And they, all right. And she said, you know, when they get home from school, they take their clothes off and I go through their clothes and empty their pockets. And, and they had, you know, they still had some money. And I was saying, well, I called them in. I'm like, what the hell? Didn't you give Joe any of the money? And they said, yeah, but Joe said he only charges kids a dollar. So, I mean, it was very sweet to hear that, you know. So he started that company and the man couldn't read or write English. Everything was phonetics. Uh. And then my mom stayed at home and had the taxi phone. So she was there, you know, taking all the messages for the calls. We didn't have CB radios or cell phones. And it was like madhouse because the phones were ringing. And then, then he got a brilliant idea. I thought it was quite brilliant. He went to the lumber yard and he got an old telephone pole and he plowed it into the front of the ground in the house. And he put a huge spotlight on top and he ran a wire through the yard into the house. And anytime the phone rang, my mom would write down the call because he was parked right, right around the corner at the taxi stand by the bridge. So he could see that spotlight from where he was sitting. So anytime my mom got a call and he wasn't there, She'd write it down, plug the spotlight in, and then he'd come home and get the call. Tell the funny stuff. I want you to tell, because I know you played in rock bands and you played in wedding bands. So I want you to tell the wedding band story about, because <laughs> I have a story for you after you tell your story. Well, yeah. So in the wedding bands, it was, it was kind of horrible. We'll see. But you made a lot. You made way more money yeah. than you yeah. did in any bar. But So that's why you did them. So, you know, the wedding band, you'd go, and, and then the cocktail hour was the worst because... No, nobody believed me, but people would, didn't hear anything you saying because they were too busy eating <laughs> and talking and this and that. And I used to say to the guys in the band, they don't listen to what we're saying because they did. And, no, and nobody believed me. So the, the band, the guy who was, you know, calling out the, the tunes, he goes to me, okay, calls out the tune. So we start doing this bossa nova, real sexy and soft, you know. And I figured I would, you know, screw them up a little bit. And I changed the words to the song, right? So I'm singing, she was tall, she was tan, she was hot, she was tall, she was tan, she was hot. And she walked on down from the aisle of Ipanema with a big straw hat and a dildo named Sam. <laughs> wow. The guys were hysterical. And I and, I, and everybody in the audience is fine. Like nothing was wrong in Ipanema. You know, they just kept eating the shrimp. <laughs> and I'm here today with Paul Spadoni, the author of An American Family in Italy. Uh, and I believe without permission, correct? Right. Living this, living the La Dolce Vita without permission. Uh, so now I want to talk about you <laughs> taking this leap of faith with two teenage girls, which I could just imagine. I mean, the book, the book really outlines it <laughs> pretty clearly. Uh, and having to, to navigate around 
the language, uh, the trains, the schools, the work. I mean, how did you, how did this all come together? And I know you have well, a couple of stories about it. I think the train and, and I think one about going to get some paperwork done, right? Oh, yeah. We tried to get our, from Esso di Sojourno. Well, well, first of all, I, I didn't actually have permission to work there. The uh, headmaster of the school, he was a little bit loose on the regulations, and he just needed somebody for one year to fill in for a, a teacher who had quit suddenly. So he said, well, really, we should get the work permit. He says, but that's, you know, that's so difficult. He says, just tell them you're coming there for vacation. Now, this was pre-9-11, um, uh, and so they weren't quite as uh, checking things as much. So I, I, he said, just come and tell them that you're a tourist there. And yes, now I know you can only stay for three months at a time, but I don't even know if they stamped our passports when we came in through Rome. Sometimes they didn't do that at that time. We anyhow, we had no problem staying for 10 months. And he paid me cash. I'd come in at the end of the month, and uh, he'd open a drawer and take out a bunch of money and give him my pay. I always wondered, you know, maybe he had like a gun on top of that water cash he had in his drawer. Who knows? But uh, I was able to work that way, and he found me an apartment. Um, so that part worked out amazingly. But again, there's no way. I think my book, I say, is more of a how not to do book than a how to do book. Because you can't repeat what I do and say, hey, I'm going to do what Paul did. You know, well, you can't stay for more than three months. You probably can't get a job the way I did and find an apartment. It's just it would be you'd have to go through a lot more red tape. But we did try to get a permesso di soggiorno, and we went six times to the um, Questura and finally gave up because of the requirements they were trying to make us go through. But I realized later that if you just go to a different Questura, you'd probably be okay because we found so many times that we'd go to one official and they'd say, oh, no, no, that can't be done. And then you'd go to another one, <clears throat> could be in the same office, and they'd say, oh, yeah, no problem. Um, it happened when Lucy tried to get her bus pass. We, get, we tried to get a monthly bus pass. And they went up and said, oh, no, no, you can't get this without a permesso di soggiorno. And I already had mine because I'd been there a week earlier. So I said, look, there's another clerk. There's two lines there. We're just going to go through the other line. And I'll, get, I'll, I'll put the money out and the form out. Just like that. Hopefully the <laughs> clerk was five feet away. wasn't going to look over and say, hey, we just said you can't do that. But... <laughs> So we ran into that kind of, um, you know, red tape. Uh, we had, so we got our monthly bus passes. Um, we had lots of misadventures on trains. One time we got on a train going the wrong direction. The other time, one of my, my older daughter was going to come visit us. And she was cutting in in the middle of the night. And we thought, well, what if she's asleep? So I got asked permission to the conductor. Can I just go through? Is it like a little train with like about four cars? Can I just go through and see if my daughter's on there asleep? And he said, sure. So I ran through and looked, no, she's not there. The next train pulled in and it was a little bit longer. So I got on and the train started up with me on it. So there I am going somewhere, <laughs> no ticket. <laughs> she's not on the train. And the train went for about 20 minutes before it stopped. I had to get off and get at this station at like four in the morning and it was freezing to death because it was December. And then I had to get back on again, and I hid in the bathroom so they wouldn't ask me for my ticket. Got back to bottom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyhow, right. we did a lot of things wrong, but it was just unforgettable experience. It's a great time. We remember those. We'll remember those forever. And I'm here today with uh, Peter Francesi, and he is the author of two great books: Tales of a Brooklyn Grocer and Nettie, the Tales of a Brooklyn Nana. So, welcome, Pete. Thanks for being here. Or even uh, another story with the policeman. They would come in, and there were there were a bunch of these kind of stores. It was called the Franzese Italian American Grocery Store, according to a picture I found. And uh, there were like a, a bunch of little shops like this right in the area. So the cop, my great grandfather, would charge him say fifteen cents for a, a ham and cheese sandwich, but he charged her about say twenty five cents. I'm just giving an example. And the cop came in and he, he says, well, your father charges me 15 cents. He tells me the oldest sister, Margie. And she said, I'm not my father. If you want it for 20, <laughs> she goes, if you want it for 15 cents, you can go down the store to uh, one of the other places. <laughs> and so he said, just go make the sandwich. So he, my grandfather laughed. He said that his sister, who was the oldest sister, um, although she had a high school education and wasn't allowed to go to college like her brothers, 
he said was a better business person than his brother than his brother or his father had ever been. So there was a lot of inspiration and inspiring characters that came through their life growing up in that little house. I'll tell you a funny bakery story about my uncle. My uncle worked for right. a bakery in Corona, Queens, uh, Leonard's, and uh, they were they were connected. And um, <laughs> uh, my, you know, he was the baker. He had to be two o'clock in the morning, or whatever, and I guess he would park in a certain spot. And uh, one day he comes out and there's a parking ticket on the car. And he'd never gotten a parking ticket before, right? So he takes the parking ticket and he puts it up behind the counter. Right. And the sergeant comes in and orders, you know, his pastries or whatever. Where normally back then, you know, we're talking the 50s. They didn't, you know, right. they didn't pay. Uh, <laughs> and my uncle tells him, you know, $2, $3, whatever. So what do you mean $2, $3? He says, you see the ticket? He says, when the ticket's paid off, you get it for free again. The sergeant, <laughs> the sergeant made the policeman who gave him the ticket come in, give him the money for the ticket. <laughs> Great. See, I mean, that, it just shows you that, you know, back then, people figured things out themselves. They didn't go to social media to, to fight it out instead of doing it. They just faced each other, and they solved their problems and moved on. And, and that's what I think is part of the simplicity of life that was lost. From my grandfather's generation to my own. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's we'll that's, never, that's we'll true. never get it back. But it made me think about why my grandfather couldn't understand the complexities of life at times. He was perplexed by, you know, how things happen with people, or or the, or how how we got so far into problems. And he was somebody that was what was very much had a total recall of the past, but he was very interested in the in the current life that he was living. And and even though he was ninety two when he died in December twenty nineteen, he had no interest in going. He was interested in living. Yeah, I'll never forget uh, the last conversation with him. That my grandfather had lost two wives, and both both were you know young when they passed. And I said to him, "Are you going to be with your wives?" He goes, "No, I want to stay with you." <laughs> That's one of my one of my favorite lines of the, our last conversation. I want to stay with you. Uh, my mother came as a child in 1914. She's a five-year-old child. Uh, my father came uh, as a 27-year-old uh, veteran of World War I uh, from, uh, uh, from Casoli in Abruzzo. So what, so what year was that? Uh, 1925. So was that um, just before they... they put that, you know, with the restrictions on, or was he able to get in? Well, as a matter of fact, it was after. And as a matter of fact, he was illegal. And in fact, he was doubly illegal. Uh, he, uh, for some reason, I haven't figured it out. I should, uh, I, he was, I never asked, he never told, but he went to Cuba first and stayed for a while. It might've been a couple of years in Cuba. And then he took uh, a ship from Cuba to New Orleans in August of 1935, uh, 25. And, uh, he was, uh, he was a clandestine, uh, an illegal, uh, stowaway. And they caught him. And, uh, at first, in my first uh, research, uh, I thought they caught him and left, let him go. But now I found more information. They actually deported him back to where he came from. But a couple of weeks later, he came in on the same ship. And I don't know how he did it, but they didn't catch him. And he uh, ended up in Chicago uh, a little bit later and uh, worked there for about uh, seven or eight years before he uh, married my mother in Chicago Heights. We'll be right back. Experience Italy like never before, traveling with a scheduled group or create your own bespoke tour with friends with PhilItaly.com. Pack your bags and follow Phil. That's www.PhilItaly.co.
That's so interesting. That's that's funny. So so was he able to become a legal citizen, or it didn't matter? Oh well, it did matter. As uh, uh, he. He married my mother. Maybe he married her for her citizenship. Uh, she gained citizenship naturally when she was born because my grandfather was a citizen. But uh, during the 1930s, my father did apply for citizenship, uh, but they didn't let him have it. He was uh, studying for it. But uh, when World War II broke out, he was declared an enemy alien. And then I now have new records that have just come through of uh, a number of hearings that took place in downtown Chicago uh, to, to investigate uh, his status. And since he was without papers, uh, he was, uh, uh, they prevented him from getting it. They set up something for him to go to Canada and uh, to apply for citizenship to the the U.S. consul there, but somehow there was a problem with his uh, employment and they did not certify it. So he did not get his citizenship until uh, 1947. And we're pleased to, that it happened, but it was a, a big rigmarole and it was a big worry factor all during World War II.
you know, how did you come about to write this story about um, the, the War of the Vespers, uh, you know, eight, nine hundred years ago? Yeah, wow. I mean, where do I start by to unpack all of this? Um, so when I set out to write my first novel, I wanted to write a novel about Sicily. I wanted to write something that had to do with my heritage. And I, when I was looking around, and especially growing up, the first thing I usually heard when I told people about my Sicilian heritage was kind of a reference to that dreaded M word, you know, oh, hey, like the mafia, <laughs> the godfather, you know, hey, like stuff like that. And there's this, I, I guess I want to say there's this stereotype of Sicilian Sicilians as that mafia centric place. I mean, that's pretty much what you hear, gangsters, mobsters, stuff like that. And I, I grew up on epic stories like, you know, Joan of Arc and Braveheart and Gladiator. So when I set out to tell a story about Sicily, I wanted to uh, paint it in a more heroic light. I wanted to give it, I wanted to interpret it from a new lens um, in a way that made uh, Sicily seem like the grand kingdom that it once was. It was actually its own kingdom. Um, you know, obviously before it became part of Italy, it was, and it was conquered by every civilization in the Mediterranean, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs, the Normans. So Sicily has this long history that a lot of people don't really know about. And I wanted to capture all of that through the lens of a historical epic in the style of a Braveheart. So that kind of started me on my journey as I wrote this uh, historical thriller, as I like to call it. Uh, yeah, so, so as you're researching this, how do you come up with, you know, heroin and, and um, you know, the, the villain and, and all of that kind of stuff? What, what's the process to, to pick uh, Etna as the heroine and make her the focal point of, of the novel? Yes. Yeah, so, well, you actually, you did ask this. So yes. So, so the book is based on an event, a true event called the Sicilian Vespers. And this event took place in Sicily in Palermo, the capital of Palermo in 1282. And what happened was on the night of Easter, the people of Palermo were, co were coming together to celebrate. And the French at that time occupied Sicily. And they were known to be very abusive, a lot of cases of rape and molestation. And what happened was as the Sicilian people were coming together, together to celebrate Easter at the Easter vigil, the French kind of showed up, crashed the party. They started groping the women, bullying the men. And allegedly, as the legend goes, a woman took out her blade she stabbed a French soldier and she cried, Morano li Francisi, which means death to the French or the death to the Angevins. And that sparked this people's uprising in Palermo that eventually spread across the whole island where the Sicilians essentially slaughtered 3,000 French soldiers, men, women, anybody who spoke French. Siciliana essentially puts the woman at the center of that story. And I, I gave her a name, Etna Vespiri, Etna named after the great volcano, of course. And um, so I kind of I fictionalize the story and give it to this woman named Etna. And you see her as she goes on her journey, inspiring the people and fighting the French. Yeah, that's that's so neat. So now as I'm reading the book, I've I've delved way, way back into my ancestry because my paternal grandmother comes from two noble families. And I actually can trace back to both Roger and Charles I as direct descendant from them wow <laughs> so it was very interesting that is going through it that i'm kind of wow i'm on both sides of this conflict you know? <laughs> now when you say charles the first you mean ray carlu charles the first of yes, Sicily yes, yes, during yeah. the, the time yeah. of the vespers wow yeah amazing and it's all through it's all through my my paternal um grandmother's mother uh because she is i don't know if you ever heard the name caracciolo but she is she was no. a caracciolo and they were from 950 on, one of the most, and still today, one of the most, you know, known families in Naples. And I was also interested as I was going through it that the Sicilians then petitioned the Spanish yes. at some point, which was, I didn't real, I didn't know that part, that that early on that they had petitioned the Spanish. Yes. So there's, there's multiple, uh, there are a few interpretations of how that worked. Some say the, the Teutonic Knights betrayed the Sicilian people by by bringing the spanish in and essentially the spanish then came in and conquered mm -hmm. others say that it, that was always part of the plan that they were always kind of like fishing for a new leader and that was that happened to be spain so yes um in my book i like to i i, I won't give it all away but i do pick one of those lanes <laughs> and, and i go down one of those lanes 
I think the both of us are trying to do the same thing. We're trying to give a, a window to the, to the Italian Americans, um, so that, so that they can be known and, and again, back to the history that we, we know our history. Uh, and, and just, you know, to digress a little bit, I, you also do another fascinating little bit, um, where you do that Italian American moment, I think you call it. Uh, and you, Tell people not about you know the Joe DiMaggio's and and uh, uh, the you know the Sylvester Stallones and those people, but the people that really contributed a lot to our history in America that nobody ever heard of. Well, just recently, so for everyone, uh, I do these videos, very short videos. Uh, I try not to go over a minute. Um, writing those is a different technique because now you're trying to take this ton of information and condense it to one minute uh it's it's just like giving people that little quick overview of this uh invention accomplishment story in hopes that hey if they really enjoy this person or this subject they'll research it a little more so just recently um i was i was blown away uh these two uh, uh twin sisters that recently came to our italian cultural center and started volunteering they said, wow, you know, I told them about these Italian-American moments. And they go, you should do one on Simon Rodia. I'm like, okay, who's Simon Rodia? So I look it up. Uh, Bob, I was blown away. I was blown away. Never heard of this gentleman. The Watts Towers in California. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the story. I, I kind of think you are from your expression. Yeah. Um, I was blown away. What an incredible accomplishment. and. I like was giddy getting the info, writing this moment, and then having patience waiting for my son to help me <laughs> make the video, <laughs> which unfortunately, that's my, uh, he's a great, great son and God bless him for helping me, but he does have a life as well. So uh, I was waiting, 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 and we finally did it. And I was just, I was like ecstatic to do it. And I mean, real quick story, Italian immigrant not even five feet tall, uh, decides to start building on his property in Watts, which I'm not real familiar with California, but I think it's not like the greatest of areas. And he starts building these towers out of materials he finds, out of garbage. And he was a tile setter, so I mean, he, he you know, he knew what he was doing, obviously. Uh, and he would bend pipe and the railroad track, he had no ladder, he had no scaffolding, he had no power equipment, okay? He had a, a bucket, a hammer, a shovel, a chisel, and his hands. And this little man would build a section and then climb up it and build another section and then climb up it and build another section. And the tallest one's 100 feet high. Did this by himself over 30 years every day and he left it he just like donated it he wanted to do something big and he looked up to fellow italians like michelangelo and galileo and he wanted to do something big and boy he did it and after he was gone the city um they either wanted to move it or they wanted to destroy it i'm not really sure but they said, oh, it's not safe. So, you know, we can't keep this here. And they brought like a crane and they tested it. And son of a gun, the thing was built like Fort Knox from this little man. And I mean, my God, it's, it's a movie waiting to happen. It's a lot of things. He was, he did have a little bit of uh, publicity. Uh, he was on the cover of the Beatles album, the album cover, which, you know, today's youth wouldn't even know what I was talking about. But Back in the day when they had records, the cover, the album cover was a big deal. The Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album cover. There's all these like famous people and there's a picture of him. Really? And it, yes. So, I mean, now I have to go look at the album. <laughs> famous, but not. You know what I mean? He was yeah, part yeah. of the like, pop culture thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just stuff like that. I've done... Uh, I think 103 of these Italian American moments and I'm very proud of those. And I'm, I'm, and you know, if my goal is there a tool to learn for our, for our people, that's it. A tool to learn, to, to inspire, to give 
a little spark for, I want to know more. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, we don't get enough credit for these unsung heroes like that. Uh, you know, oh, it's okay. The, 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 <laughs> built, the people that built America and, and yes. things. You yes. Know? No, no. There's so, and like you said, there's so many stories out there. And, uh, you know, me, you, we're, we're, we're reading about it. We're looking at things. We're researching things. And then all of a sudden you get this name and you look it up and go, I never heard of this guy. And I'm just, I'm blown away. I really was. It just yeah. shows you how much more is out there. And for people, I think like you and me, it's a thrill to find out about it. We're just so happy to, to let everybody else know about it. I have such pride letting them know to say, hey, this is a good one. You want to see this one. Where's your family from in Italy? So I'm kind of, um, I like to joke around and say I'm an Italian mutt. So I'm predominantly, um, my dad's from Puglia and my mother is Sicilian. But then again, mom's grandmother was from up north. We thought it was Genoa, but like recently we've been, I've been doing a little more um, um, like research and we're finding that that name is not from Genoa, but possibly from Sardinia. So I'm in the process now of digging a little deeper, which excites me very much because my son is com one of my sons is completely in love with Sardinia. So I'm like, okay, well, if we're from there, it's a good place to buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I haven't been there, but I have Sardinian roots going back to like, I don't know, 1100 or some crazy thing oh, like wow. that. Uh, and uh, I'd love to go there. Well, I've been so many places that I, I, I want to visit, um, but haven't been there, but you go, you go to Italy all the time. Yeah. yeah I do. I, um, I go, um, well, now a couple times a year, but for extended periods of time. So I'm there, um, like right now this year, I was there for a month now in April, and then I'm going back in a couple of weeks for the summer, and I'm going to come home for a month and then go back again for the fall. So I'll be there like uh, mid-September till mid-November. Mid so it's uh, it's kind of my dream. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Um, so when did you have... Uh, when did your grandparents come and where did they settle? Well, so my dad, actually, I'm first generation on my dad. Oh, okay. My dad came over in 1957 um, from Roseto Valfortore, um, which is in northern Puglia, in a little, it's a little mountain village. And that's actually where I take people. So we'll come back to that. And um, he came here when he was 16, finished high school here and, um, you know, lived here the rest of his life. I mean, he's still, he's 82 he still goes back and forth also with me. So um, it's always fun. <laughs> I bet. So, so now was it, I, you know, I have a friend that I just connected with after not talking to my neighbor from around the corner and his wife, uh, who's, she was born in Italy. Uh, and she said it was a real culture shock for her coming from a small town in Italy. And uh, I guess she came probably uh maybe around the same time i mean we're in our 70s so wow. you know what did you what did your dad say about that i mean what was his experience coming well you know when he um he told me when he came here he first of all he came over on the christopher columbus ship ah. uh, so i've got a cool picture of him with his friend who was uh um had the same name as me. His name was Dorino. And he always used to tell me as a kid, Oh, you have a beautiful name. You know, I always thought that was cool. But anyway, um, the two of them came over on the same ship and, uh, you know, he was, you know, high school age kid, but he said he truly thought that he was going to see streets paved in gold. So he was disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, you know, when you're a kid from a peasant village, it's, it's not hard to think that, wow, there's something big out there. And, you know, it doesn't seem unrealistic. It seems, you know, wow, that could be, you know, that's the stories you hear and that's the stories you believe. And so, so why did his, um, why did his parents, go? or did he come by himself? He came by himself. Um, his mom died when he was, uh, I think 11 or 12 and his dad had just remarried over there. And so he decided that he should come here. And so he came and lived with my own, uh, his, his uncle, my great uncle, um, who was his mother's brother, who was already in the Washington DC area. So, um, that's where he came. Wow. That's something that's, that takes a lot of guts to come over at 16 years old. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, my dad had an interesting story because, um, he was born in 1941 
and you know during the war and um he was actually born in ethiopia so even though and and technically it was italy because it was a colony of italy at the time but it was um you know but it was at us above ethiopia and uh he was there until he was i think he said almost two and then um but then the british came in and kicked the italians out and so to speak this is the story i got from my uncle who had gone to venezuela and he i, I saw him in italy one last time before before he died, but my dad's older brother, he was about nine or 10. So he's telling me this story of their life and exodus from Ethiopia from his 10, nine, 10 year old perspective, you know? So he said, you know, so the British came in, they all got put in camps and my dad actually caught malaria as a baby. And he's on, they're on this ship that had to go around the Southern tip of Africa to get back to Italy, because then he said the Italian ship came and brought us back to Italy. Um, and so anyway, so, um, and my dad tells the story that, you know, even in our little peasant village, the Germans had come through and the Americans had come through, but he claims that it was an American, um, there was somebody visiting from the States who spoke some English. And my dad, as a baby, had gotten back to Italy and has malaria. And um, he said that this this American at Rosatan went down to the encampment of the American soldiers at the bottom of town, and he got the quinine from them, which is what saved my dad. So he says the Americans saved his life. So um, it was kind of a, one of those stories, you know, but it was a rough time, you know, and my grandfather was a prisoner of war in India then for, I think, four, four, I think four plus years. So I, but my dad sent my mom and me and my sister back um, when I was about four um, because he wanted us kids to learn Italian in the Italian oh, way. Yeah. So I went back just long enough. I mean, I think we went back for like half a year. Um, but I went to preschool there. So I went to preschool in the village and, you know, I guess, you know, I learned how to speak Italian. My mom said I didn't speak English when I came home for a while. And then all of a sudden she said, I only spoke English and wouldn't go back to the Italian, but we kept going back. And so I always spoke it and I've always luckily, um, held on to it. You know, I studied it some in college and high school, I studied Spanish. Um, so I'm fluent in both, um, just because they're so similar. And of course, growing up, my dad had an Italian restaurant after, after the, after the dream of the barbershop, he wanted to have a restaurant named Rosetto after our town in Italy, down in Bethesda, Maryland in the 80s and 90s. So um, at work, I got to practice my Spanish and my Italian because half the employees were Italian, half were Hispanic. So I got to practice both. And I came out of high school speaking, you know, a couple languages. So it worked out pretty good for me. So anyway, and I do speak the dialect as well, which, you know, speaking a dialect, I just have to touch on this for a second, but speaking a dialect is like putting your pajamas on. It's comfortable. It's cozy. It's, it's just, um, it's very personal. So like when I'm in the village, I don't speak Italian. When I'm in the village, I speak dialect because I don't, you don't want to sound, you know, like somebody else told me that they had moved away and they speak, you know, they have to work in business and they speak pure Italian. And um, he said, but there's no way I can speak Italian in the village. Cause then I'm above everybody, you know, you gotta, mm. you gotta be part of the part of the gang, you know, you just gotta get back into the, the local. And um, it is, it's very, and, and there's certain words and certain things that they say that just have so much more meaning um, when you say them in dialect, they, it's so much more feel. It's like you're really getting into everything, you know? So it's, uh, it's kind of cool. Hey.